go ahead and pray and we'll get started tonight. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this evening and for the word, uh, mostly for your Holy Spirit and the understanding that you give us, the, the teaching that we so need from you, we, we ask that you would bring to us, Lord. And we pray that you would help us all who are here in person and, and for those who will watch later on at other times, we pray you would give them your spirit of wisdom and understanding as well. We ask you now in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, we're starting in Proverbs 11 and verse 9. And, uh, next time I order pizza, so we have a better class. <laughs> 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 All right, would someone like to read verse 9 and 10? I'm just sure. Okay. Aaron. Aaron. Oh, I'll Aaron. You. Oh, man. you got the next one. Aaron. <laughs> <Pardon me. laughs> <laughs> With his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. When it goes well with the righteous, the seed rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there is joyful shout. All right. Thanks, sir. What do you guys hear as we read those passages? Um, I heard ding dong, the witch is dead. Ding dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> Absolutely. At least that's what we're hearing in verse 10, isn't it? <laughs> when the wicked perish, there is joyful shout. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's all I hear in my head right now. Now you're going to be singing, right? The Wizard of Oz. With his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor. What's another term for that? What would we call that? Curse. Say again. Curse. Cursing? Yeah. I didn't know your question. Um, when, when it says, the with his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor. So we have cursing his neighbor is, is a thing that... That could another word for that. What are some other words that might be used to explain when when someone is saying destroying their neighbor verbally? Gossip. Gossiping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Slandering. Slandering. Insulting. Yeah. Uh, insulting. So we're we're talking bad about our neighbor. It says that uh, with his mouth the godless man. So uh, if we're desiring to surrender ourselves to the Lord and, and allow the Spirit of God and to be godly, not godless, but godly, a godly man, a godly woman, then uh, we get exactly what the New Testament tells us repeatedly about controlling our tongue and not speaking against one another. Uh, bless and do not curse, right? So uh, if we hear ourselves or we hear someone else constantly destroying their neighbor or others around them with their words uh, what it should remind us of this verse should remind us wait a minute I am not I'm not operating in the will of God at all and that should be a good thing it should correct us the, the, the word was sent to correct rebuke and to train us in righteousness so these type of little proverbs they're they're not always meant to make us feel good. Sometimes they're meant to say, hey, <laughs> don't destroy your neighbor with your mouth. Don't sit in bad mouth and complain and, and uh, gossip about little things. Um, but it also goes on then and says, but through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. And I know we've kind of talked about that, but do you guys have uh, something you would add to it? Maybe in light of some of the things we've said over the last several weeks. What kind of knowledge would deliver a righteous man? So lately, I've been dealing with somebody repeatedly for months who's been doing exactly what verse, the first part of verse 9 says. And I think that I would probably be responding the same way had I not known anything about the Word of God and really taken it to heart and really let it almost worry me in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so gain that, that understanding, even whenever I don't fully understand it, I still have the Word of God in me, and I think that's what helps pull at my heart and pull at my soul a little bit more to keep from responding.
responding in the same way. Yes. So yeah. they're just not responding at all. <laughs> right. But that's, you're obeying the word. Right. And you're doing that because you believe in God who's writing it to you. It's not just a literature book. I mean, you know, we, we can read Snow White or something, and it doesn't mean that we're going to go out and sing Hi Ho, Hi Ho. But when we believe there's a God who wrote the Bible to us, and we're going to stand accountable to Him someday, then it does change us. We At least it should. If we have any fear of God, any awe of God, it should cause us to go, wait a minute, they're treating me in a bad way. I want to treat them bad in return. But I'm also hearing God speak to me from verses so I'm going to submit to God right now and not to what I want to do, mm -hmm. which is, exactly right. praise God. <laughs> so, yeah. So that knowledge alone, as, as Ashley shared with us, the knowledge of not responding with the same thing that you were dealt out is a knowledge that is delivering her from coming under judgment herself. If she's silent in her response, as scripture tells her, and she walks in the knowledge of truth, she doesn't come under any type of judgment from God, no discipline from the Lord. In fact, she's righteous. The other person can say all they want, condemnation, judgment, discipline will come on them, but she avoids that because of the knowledge of truth, the word that she's heard, and because she's a doer of it. We all know being a hearer doesn't do any good for you. <laughs> You've got to be a doer of the word for it to have any, uh, for it to count for us. But. Yeah, what a great way for those two parts of verse 9 to fit together. It's how knowledge delivers us. So verse 10, we've already heard uh, Kathy's take on that. Um, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. We didn't really talk about that so much, but we certainly, if you have a, a, a good leader in your city, a, a great mayor or a great president or a great you know, principal or superintendent over your school, anywhere there's righteous leadership, your boss at work, if you've got a good, solid, righteous person who is fair and honest and maintains justice and rule in a good way, and, and yet they're gracious, and uh, man, everybody, even the people who get mad at them occasionally, you know, because there's going to be people who don't like that, but... Uh, but the majority of the people are going to love that someone stands up against a bad person. Someone doesn't let chaos go on. Someone maintains law and order, which is what leaders are put in position for. That's a God-ordained position. Political leaders are God-ordained positions. And when they don't do what they're supposed to is when the people cry out. Ding, ding. It's really hard, right? We, we, we rejoice when they're gone because it's very hard to live under evil leadership. How many of you have had a really bad boss? Okay, I've, I've had a few of them. Um, and, and not in the last 27 years. I've had a pretty good boss. He's, he's not too good. <laughs> but, you know, he's, he's pretty fair. He handles things pretty well. Um, I've had a few people that I have pastored who thought they were my boss individually. As a body, they are. But as individuals... Uh, not so much, and it, that's created some difficulties sometimes over the years. But, um, anyways, uh, if you've ever had a bad boss, someone who managed really poorly, or uh, you got the power trip kind of thing, and they're they don't know what they're doing, but they're trying to tell you what to do, which is all messed up. It's so frustrating to go to work. It's frustrating to live under that, and so. Uh, I think we all understand what's being said there. Uh, um, we rejoice, a city rejoices, a company rejoices under good leadership. They don't when it turns bad. And uh, that's simply what it's saying. And we all have experienced that in some way, shape or form. Hello, there. All right. Anybody else have maybe something you wanna add, Mark? <clears throat> I was just thinking here in Proverbs, 11 verse 9, back to verse 9. Uh, with his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor. It makes me think of how a person can take years and years and years of tireless labor mm -hmm. with the work of his hands and build his life and reputation. And just how long that can take someone to do and just how quick words can destroy yeah. a person 
and their reputation. And it reminds me of in Ecclesiastes at the end of verse 9, chapter 9, uh, Solomon says, but one sinner destroys much of it. Yeah. And just kind of talking about how quickly uh, sin, or even the means of sin, can destroy a long lifetime of good. Yeah. Um, so I just saw that contrast there of just how uh, slander equals, right, destroying, but just how someone can take years and years and years and just that contrast of laboring with the hands, mm -hmm. working, building one's reputation, and then just how powerful words are, yeah. and just how quick they can torch or tarnish a reputation that has taken a long time to build. Yeah. I think the modern world has learned that more than ever. Not not learned it in a good way. They've learned how powerful whatever they say in social media can just cause a wildfire and destroy people very quickly. And they don't care if it's true or not. They don't care about validating. They just say things out of emotion and, and it, it does. It's brought tons of destruction to people. Isn't that what the preacher you were talking to about last uh, Wednesday? Not Billy Graham, the other one. Yeah. Um, Charles Templeton? Yeah, Charles Templeton was his name. Yeah. It's the same thing that I kind of was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and just that there's comfort that the true the true essence of knowledge about a person, you know, will prevail. Mm -hmm. uh, what yeah. is true will prevail, yeah. and it will deliver the righteous. Uh, but I think just what I'm gathering from that is just how powerful words are, yeah. and just how quick they can torch. Right? And scripture says that it sets the, it sets on fire the course of life. Yeah. Right? How a small spark can burn a whole forest. Yeah. Right? Just how. How quickly words can destroy. Even in our own home, you know. Oh yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's why God says so much in even the New Testament, but as well as in the Proverbs throughout the Old Testament, He says a lot about what we do with our mouth. A lot. Yeah, James yes. says that the tongue is set on fire by hell itself. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Which shows just how powerful the tongue is. It, it's small, but it can cause so much. And it's hard to take back what you do. Right. Once you've said something, and we probably all have said things that we wish we could grab and pull back. Yeah. And once it's out there, it's out there. Mm -hmm. And what the sad thing is, as Jesus taught, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah. So the roughest part about that is you can you can say it and go, Oh, I was just kidding, I was just kidding. Mm -hmm. No, it was in your heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you can you might fool some people. Some people might want to think you were believing, but uh, faking it or pretending or making a joke. But the real honest truth is most of us understand that behind almost every joke, there's truth there. Um, maybe not the whole thing. Maybe you're expounding, maybe you're making more of it in the joke, but there's always an element of truth. Uh, if you're picking on somebody for whatever, you know, uh, their, their hair, and then you say they're kidding, you're kidding. There's an element of why you are picking on them, or it wouldn't even be funny, right? Uh, whatever you pick on, there's an element of truth. And so we, we're we much better. That's why Scripture tells us not to coarse joke, because we it's an unloving thing to hurt people. It's, it's a different thing when we know we're cutting up with somebody and we, we're on the same page, and it's a very lighthearted. We do that a lot in this class. Um, but uh, when it's done not in love, it can be a very hurtful thing and, and the, the tongue can cause so much damage um, but uh, to, to end on a positive note as we wrap up this part if someone does this to you as, as Ashley said she's kind of enduring right now um, stick by doing the right thing uh, be silent in your response or kind in your response do what God tells you to in the moment let God be the one who protects your reputation restores your reputation. If someone's cut your name to pieces, let God be the one who saves it down the road. I know I've had to learn that lesson as a pastor over the years. There's been times I've come back at someone and then they took my comeback and they even made things worse. And it would have been better if I'd have just been silent like what Ashley's saying. Um, I'm not always silent. I'm not well, always I know. I, we're not I'm always. I've gotten better at it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, many years ago, we had someone do something really bad to our church at Rock Hill. And 
Uh, then whenever we pressed charges and everything um, and removed them from the church and took that action, then that person and some of his family started saying that I was not a Christian and all kinds of stuff. And, um, and so I just said to someone that I thought was someone I could just say this to, um, I didn't steal from the church. I didn't lie. I didn't do all these things. Why am I the one who's not the Christian? <laughs> but um, that, be careful who you think you can trust when you tell things. I, that's happened to me more times than I can count where I have thought I was talking to someone I could just kind of say something like that back to and then they go and they tell them. And then it, get, it got worse. And so the Lord came and said, right there in the word be silent <laughs> quit trying to respond quit trying to argue them out you'll never win just be quiet let me take care of it so I did and there's been multiple times I've had people get really mad say very ugly things about me and our little community and you just have to weather the storm try to keep doing right if you've done wrong you confess it ask God's forgiveness go to people you've heard ask for forgiveness God himself restores the reputation but um the, the hard part is when we try to fight our way through it. I mean, <laughs> you definitely see it with Christ where um, the illegal trial that they performed at night and how so many false witnesses were produced. Yeah. And in a sense, Christ was not destroyed. That was himself, but destroyed in the flesh, you know, dying in the flesh. But, yeah. but just how that ran its course to the point of his death, yeah. you know. Yeah. But yeah, how the Bible had emphasized, on the other hand, just how powerful controlling the tongue is, that James would say, if a man is capable of bridling his tongue, he's a perfect man. Yeah. Which is like a very, like a, it's a pretty outrageous statement, you know, just kind of how it emphasizes self-control. Or even, a fool is considered wise. He just when he doesn't wise. speak. <laughs> exactly. A fool is considered wise when he doesn't speak, and just how that emphasizes yeah. the, the opposite of self-control, just how powerful self-control is with your tongue, yeah. and just how destructive your tongue can be when it's not controlled. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other thing is that everybody I've ever known, including myself, if, when your character has been attacked, the more you try and defend yourself, yeah. you just look guilty. You do, right. don't you? Psychologically, people are going to assume. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So true. <laughs> so true. 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 <laughs> Which makes you wonder that yeah. yeah. when Jesus was in that situation, he didn't respond. When before his revilers, he did not revile on yeah. his return. Yeah. On accusations yeah. and stuff. He actually set us a good example of just let them say what they're going to say. Because, I mean, honestly, how do you win when it's your word against somebody else's word? And there's always going to be a crowd standing around, and they're they're weighing out. Well, he kind of sounds guilty because this is the way he's trying to defend himself. But if you're just silent, then they can sit there and go, "Okay, the only person talking is that guy. Yeah, he sounds like a liar." <laughs> but if we're both talking, they really don't know who to believe, you know. So, yeah, but it's very hard, isn't it, to keep well, the, quiet? The, the hardest hard. one, um, personally, that I've had to deal with, but I can imagine others have a hard time is when somebody is say that you're Christianity and your belief is not real. Yeah. And that's that was probably the most cut deep. Yeah. There's a couple of them, but there, that one really cuts deep. And I just, in the beginning, I would respond, it's not true, but yeah. it, it's like whenever you don't say anything, it actually kind of breaks my heart a little bit more because he gets more, this person gets more and more angry and stirred up and it really truly makes me sad to see this person kind of out of control. It's, That's I don't want that for me. You feel sorry. I don't, exactly. It doesn't bring me happiness, but it does bring me peace of mind because on the other side, there's a lot of fear that used to be attached to that, and now I will clearly says, do not fear. Yeah. And I, yeah. I restate that in my head every single moment that I know that this is about to happen, and it has brought me so much peace of mind over the last few months. So, but I've been praying for this person. Just to show up. <laughs> or him allowing God to show up is really what yeah. yeah. And you know, one of the greatest things to remember about prayer is even when you're praying, 
it's not always about you getting what you want as much as remembering God is working on you by yes. you praying. Yes. There's a whole lot going on inside of you because you're praying for an enemy. Mm -hmm. um, he's working. And that's what we don't want to forget is God is working when we're praying for an enemy. Um, it may take years and maybe never because everybody has their own will, whether they're going to submit to God and his working on them or not. Um, but it's you're praying the, the lie we never want to agree with is that, well, my prayer's not working. It's useless to pray because they're still a jerk. <laughs> no, because if you're praying, really praying for them with a genuine heart of love for them, um, God's doing that deep, beautiful work in you, keeping you from having a hardened, angry, bitter heart, and you're filling bowls of intercession. And that's something else to remember about prayer is that Revelation describes them as bowls of intercession. So maybe I've been praying for two years. I don't know how big the bowl is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'm going to keep praying. At some point, that bowl of intercession is going to pour all over them. And that's what I'm holding out for. And I don't know when that is, but it does, that way my faith is in effect. And I'm not going, well, he's not listening. Uh, it doesn't work. Those are all lies of the enemy. You just keep praying because that's what he told you to do. How it comes about, what comes about. That's not on our part. Our part is to pray, That's and we're blessed by it. Right. it. It is, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We don't know all the circumstances, and we just say, God, help me to pray a right, the right heart, and I know God's working to me if I'm praying uh, with a good heart. So, yeah. Well, let's go to Hebrews. We uh, Sometimes we give a little more time to Proverbs, but that's a good thing. So, <laughs> so Hebrews... Chapter 11, verse 1 is the new material for tonight. Um, just very quickly, I, I like to remind everybody where we were and what the context is, and then we're going to move right into 11. Um, so we, we, two weeks ago, we dealt with a pretty difficult area. Uh, chapter 10, verse 26 up to 31. Uh, and I'm just going to read from 26, and I'm going to read all the way to the end of the chapter. So that you can kind of hear what he's saying, what the conversation has been about. Because it's going to be important as we begin to move into the conversation of faith. All right. So he says, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of truth, there is no longer there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We spent quite a bit of time going through that a couple of weeks ago. Um, then it goes on and says, But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, uh, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have uh, for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Now, right there is we're talking about faith, even without the word faith being mentioned. Um, he's talking about, therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Confidence is a, another a good word for faith. Not, not the only word because it's more than confidence, but it's an assurance, as we said last week. Uh, the definition of faith is right below it in chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, uh, the conviction of things not seen. So when he's talking about that confidence, uh, 
Don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance. What allows us to endure in this life when our property is being confiscated, when we're going through trials, when people are saying terrible things about us, destroying our character, our name, our reputation, they're doing all kinds of ugly things. What allows us to endure through all of that, holding on to the faith, holding on to God, is a confidence in the reward that we are going to get, the possession that is a lasting possession. That's why it's okay. If you think about it this way, I know the example that uh, the writer of Hebrews gives us is, you know, you endured through reproaches and tribulations and even having your property seized and things like that. But since we've been talking in Proverbs about people destroying our name with their tongues and things like that, um, Think about this, your reputation for eternity is a lasting one before the only judge that really counts. God himself knows who you are, knows what's in your heart. No matter what everybody says or anybody says, God knows your heart. And he knows that even if you made a mistake and you confess it to him and you ask for forgiveness and there's true, sincere uh, repentance, God knows that. And he lifts you up. He he honors you. There's a blessing that comes with that. Um, but mankind doesn't always believe our repentance. Doesn't always believe that we truly are sorry, that we've truly turned. Or mankind can judge us and hold things against us forever and ever or throughout their whole life. The thing is, we want to hold on to the confidence of what's coming. Living for eternity. Living, living for what God says and what God thinks. Not for what the people of this world think alone. Um, he, he says, therefore, don't throw away your confidence in that uh, better possession and that lasting hope that you have, uh, it, which is a great reward for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, which is what we've been talking about, you keep doing the will of God. You don't shrink from the faith as he, he'll say at the very end there. Um, don't shrink back from the faith. Don't deny the faith as we read in verse 26 up to 31. Don't trap underfoot. Don't uh, reject Christ for the sake of what you can gain in this world. Maybe you keep your house, your possessions, your job, your position because you denied Christ or because you were ashamed of him. He says, don't shrink back for that. Hold on, endure through, have confidence. There's a greater reward coming. Whatever you lose in this life, it's going to be worth it all for what's coming. That's what he's trying to say here. And he goes on in verse 37 and he says, For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. In a very little while. Sometimes it feels like it's a long ways off, but not according to God. Uh, he says, But my righteous, my righteous one shall live by faith. Now he's starting to introduce that subject of faith. We've already been kind of hearing it. And that endurance and that confidence, those are words that are connected to the subject of faith. And now he's saying, my righteous one, the one who does endure, the one who holds on to confidence, the one who lives for what's coming, my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now that statement goes back to verse 26 through 31. Don't shrink back. God's soul has no pleasure in one who shrinks back from their faith in him, their trust in him, their endurance, their confidence in him. Uh, he says, uh, but we are not of those who shrink back. Remember what we read in 1 John chapter 2 when we were talking about this. And I wanted to remind you guys that this is not really a subject of being saved and losing your salvation and things like that. It's, it's more of a subject of real born again experiences versus not because of what John writes to us in first John chapter two, verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. Now, whenever you look at verse chapter 10, verse 39, and he says, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction. That's that destruction that was talked about over here earlier. 
We're not of that. How is he saying that? He's saying because if you're really among us, you're not going to shrink back. You're not going to deny the faith. You're not going to apostatize yourself. If you're really among us, you're not going to leave us. But if you leave, it's just simply the evidence uh, that you were really never with us. You were never one with Christ if you can walk away from it. So um, I'm, I'm really glad John writes that. We've talked about that a lot, haven't we? It's nice to have John say that because otherwise, if you read, there are several places in Hebrews that makes it sound very, very clear that uh, if, if you don't keep the faith, you're going to hell. Um, and Revelation, we went into that a lot last week. Revelation talks about holding on to the end. Um, every letter that the seven churches talks about this, holding on to the end, that's the one who overcomes. That's the one who gets the white robe. That's the one who gets the reward. Only those who hold on to the end. And so we could, it's very easy then to say, well, then we're saved by our holding on. We're saved whether or not we continue to do good things, we continue in righteousness, we continue in good works, which now all of a sudden, it's no longer salvation by grace through faith alone. Now it's salvation by works. But that would go against what Scripture says. The Bible plain, plainly tells us in Ephesians we're not saved by works. Yes, ma'am. So basically in the army of God, we're basically the green beret. We're the ones that are like, we're the elite because we <laughs> because we have faith in our faith because we are doing the things because of our salvation. So we're not just more bodies taking up space. You know, I, I think that like you said, people can be saved by our insurance kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. But that's not us. We are the ones who are out there doing Yeah, and I would think about that. I guess, yeah, yeah. It's like we're we're showing our faith by our Good. actions. Good. Our actions can't we can't act another way because we are saved. Does that make any yeah. sense at all? Yeah. I, I can't seem to get it out of it's, my brain. It's uh, described different ways in Scripture too, I think, yeah. because it is sometimes hard to wrap your mind around it. It's yeah. Now, the hard. thing is that we, here's where I would, especially with all that we've gone through in Hebrews, but even when you bring in other parts of Scripture, I would serve the Lord as though you were committed at the level of a green Okay. To give your very best, your very all. Don't say I'm satisfied with being a lazy private who's in trouble all the time. Because I, I would say this. What the writer of Hebrews is telling us is you have no assurance of your salvation except that the living faith inside of you is producing good works, righteousness. If that faith is not producing righteous acts, you have no reason to be confident that you're born again. And that's from the mouth of Jesus to Paul to Peter to John. It's, it's throughout Scripture. God is very plain with us. He doesn't hide this. He's very plain spoken that you know a tree by the fruit that it bears. And if we think we can live this halfway in, halfway out kind of thing, he's already said, I'm not going to be mocked. I, so if I want to know, and I'm not at all... I want to be very careful. Nobody thinks that you get into heaven because of your good deeds or how much good right. works you do. You do not. You only get in by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's grace alone. But real faith that has trusted in that real grace and mercy that gives you righteousness will produce a changed life. It will produce. And what, what Hebrews is telling us from chapter 6 on is it actually invites us into such an intimate abiding relationship with the creator God that we can live and press on to perfection. Press on to it. Not that we become perfect and unable to sin. That is nowhere in scripture. Not until you get into heaven. But by the power of the spirit and a surrendered life, he says we can press on. Paul himself says, I press on. I haven't laid hold of it, but I press on to it. And he calls us, the writer of Hebrews says, yeah. press on to it. So that's a very different thing. That's, that should be our motto. Our motto shouldn't be, 
say the prayer so you don't go to hell. Our motto should be give your life away to Jesus and press on to live in perfection by the power of his spirit. If you're doing that, you have full assurance of where you're going because you have given your life to him. And Christ is alive in you, bearing his fruit, which is a sign of true living faith. James says faith that saves is faith that produces works and action. If it's not producing a changed life, if we know people, and I know we all do, who claim it, who said they're Christian, who whatever, but there's no changed life, we need to not stop praying for the salvation of their soul or pray for them to return. Everybody can backslide. Don't get me wrong. I believe in people being born again, backsliding, and things like that. I'm not saying that you can never have a stumbling period of your life. Peter stumbled, Paul stumbled, people stumbled. But what I am saying is that if there is, you know, well, what do we read there? Um, There's a big difference between stumbling sin and sinning willfully, right? If you go on sinning willfully, it's the going on. That's a consistent living, willfully. <clears throat> but if you if you just begin to stumble a little bit, you, you haven't... That's different than going on in a lifestyle of sin. And you just could care less about the Lord, church, God, reading the word. You could care less about any of it. But you always look back to when you were seven and you prayed a prayer with your Sunday school teacher. Man, I'm not hanging my eternity on that. I want to I wanna give my life to him. If he says, be in church and don't forsake my Sabbath, I'm going to be worshiping him somewhere, even if the preaching's bad. I'm going to be in fellowship with other believers and I'm going to love the church and I'm going to listen. I'm going to glean all I can from the bad preacher and the bad teachers or whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to glean all I can. I'm going to read my Bible. And I've sat in a few services before where I just decided, you know, this is tough. I'm getting milk from the podium. So I'm just going to sit here and love the Lord. Amen when he says something good occasionally, you know. But, but I'm not going to hate him. I'm not going to say things bad about him. And I, I'm not going to say, well, I'm not going back to church. I'm, I'm going to be in the house of God because he says, don't forsake gathering together, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we want to be faithful. We want to be faithful. We want to do what he says. And if he, look, it's in the top ten commandments to not forsake the Sabbath. That's a big one. We are to keep it. And, and set it apart in our week as something very special that we gather with other believers and we hear the preaching and teaching of the word. And so, you know, it's little things like that. that just where is the evidences of our faith? And um, it can be seen in all kinds of things. It's the little obediences, you know. So uh, if you don't have anything else on that, we really need to get into the passage we haven't read yet. <laughs> No, no, it's all good. It's all good. I, it's good to have this in our mind as we go into chapter 11. So now let's read chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now this is a place where you really want to stop and meditate a little bit. Um, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Uh, several weeks back we talked a lot about hope mm -hmm. and what real hope is that nobody hopes in something that they don't trust the one who's made the promise to them right I mean we we kind of unpacked that a little bit I said if it, if you knew somebody was a liar and they promised you stuff all the time and never followed through and then they said hey I'm gonna get you a brand new truck or whatever and, and you're just going oh okay you have no hope. You have no hope because hope is based on the one making the promise. It's not the promise. The promise itself is dead if you don't know the one who's making the promise. Hope comes from the person. It's the relationship. And that's a lot of what Andrew Murray uh, kind of says that when I was reading what he had to say about chapter 11. He, he talks about uh, not putting so much into uh, let me read this I'm going to skip ahead a, a little bit he says so faith is, is thus much more than just trust in the word of another it's not just trusting in the word of another it, it's uh, 
that trust is of extreme importance as its initial exercise, but the word must uh, only be the servant leading into the divine truth it contains, the living person from whom it comes, uh, to deal too exclusively with the word as the ground of faith will lead to a faith that is more intellectual than spiritual, a faith that, as the church so universally shows, rests more in the wisdom of men, in the power of reason, than in the power of God. So what he's saying in that is don't, don't put all of your faith in Pastor Chris because Pastor Chris said this is true. He says you need to have enough faith in who your teacher is for them to be able to link you to the true source of faith, which is God. Right? So if I'm telling you something, you need to say, okay, I'm going to hear what he said. I'm going to go and see where did he get it from. All I should be is a link to the one who truly gives you faith. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, uh, and hearing the word of Pastor Chris <laughs> brings faith. It says, Hearing the word of God brings faith, right? Faith cometh from hearing the word of God, not faith cometh from hearing. Now, if Chris is speaking the word of God, then it's the word of God did not lie him as a vessel, right? And so that's what we want to remember is we can easily begin to say, well, I, I trust in, you know, Tim LaHaye or I trust in uh, whatever, you know, we, we can name tons of preachers, David Jeremiah, whoever that we like or don't like or whatever and we can say well I trust and it's okay trust can be built because people earn trust they handle the word rightly and and you you know that about them they, their walk with God you know that about them it builds trust which builds some level of faith but real faith is a connecting to the supernatural not to the natural and so um, that's what point he's making there but let me let me just uh, go back to the beginning of this chapter on this because there's a really good way that he starts this in helping us understand what faith is. Um, he says, uh, the previous chapter, which is the one we just got through kind of re-going through, the previous chapter closed with the solemn lesson, there is no alternative, either believing or drawing back. Okay, there's no alternative. You either believe or you're drawing back. It's one or the other. There, there is no safety or strength for the Christian but to be strong in faith. There's no safety in anything else. You can't be shrinking back, denying the faith here and there, but saying you prayed a prayer at this age. And he says, no, there's no safety in that. The, the only safety is in fully pursuing God. That's what faith in you is going to produce. Real faith, living faith. Um, so he goes on and he says, uh, no safety or strength for the Christian, but to be strong in faith. There is no way of pleasing God, of abiding in his presence and favor except by faith, which we're going to find later. I think it's about verse six where he talks about uh, it's impossible to please God without faith. You have to have faith. So let's talk a little bit more about what faith is. He goes on and says, and so after the teaching of the epistle, which is Hebrews, as to what God has done, we are now to see that for our enjoyment of its power and blessing, uh, that is this faith that we have, Jesus died, buried, rose again, uh, the power and blessing that is accompanied by that, only one thing is needed, the fullness of faith. Jesus has done all the work to save us, to give us eternal life, to cleanse us from sin, to cause us to be born again. He's made us alive. What is, what is left? He says, all that is needed now is fullness of faith, that we grow up in our faith, that we press on into the fullness of faith, not wanting just the bare minimum of faith to get into heaven and escape hell, but press on to the fullness of faith where we really enjoy the presence of abiding in God himself, learning from him, listening to him, doing life with him, walking by the spirit, living by the spirit, bearing the fruit of the spirit. That's a life of faith. That's why this passage says, and my righteous shall live by faith, because if you don't live by faith, you won't be righteous. There's only one way to be a righteous man or woman, and it's being a man or woman of faith. We learned that from Abraham, as we're going to see in chapter 11. Abraham was counted... Uh, a man of righteousness, he 
He was accredited with righteousness because he believed God. It's faith that made him righteous. Um, our works, even when the law is given through Moses, obeying the law doesn't make you righteous. Faith in the God who gave the law and then obeying it because you believe in him, because you fear him, that faith in him and being a doer of the word, that faith is what makes you righteous. It's no different. Think about this with Abraham. He was told to leave Ur of the Chaldeans and to go into a land he had never been in. Faith caused him to obey a command. That faith, which was real faith, which caused action, which made him leave Ur, his home, home place, uh, that faith is accredited as righteousness. So, yes, it's obedience, but before obedience is faith. And, and faith, living faith, real faith should produce the obedience. Whatever God says, we do because we believe in him who's, in, who's invisible. If you don't believe in him, then why would you leave her? Why would you leave your own town? Why would you not respond to somebody who's ugly to you? Why would you go forward and say, I've given my life to Jesus who I've never met, who I've never seen, who I've never heard audibly? Why would you give your life? Why would you make a statement like that? You kind of, kind of sound foolish. Why would you say that? I'm going to turn my life over to him now. I'm no longer going to live the way I want to live. In fact, things I really like doing, I'm not going to do anymore because of him. And everybody's going, who? Jesus. Jesus, you don't let the guy who lived 2,000 years ago, born in Nazareth? Yeah. Man, he's not around here. How are you living for him? By faith. Because we believe that he not only died and buried, but he rose again. He's alive. It's faith that he exists. It's faith that he's taught us. It's faith that he's going to live in us. It's, it's faith that he's still speaking. He's still working. Without that faith, why would we do anything? See, faith is at the beginning. It's, it's at the beginning of anything we do that's going to last for eternity. Any of our obedience to God, it's, it's why the righteous will live by faith. He says, uh, it will be shown to us how this is the key. Fullness of faith is the key to the life of all God's saints and to all that God did for them. And when he says did for them, that's because we are about to go through this hall of fame of faith in chapter 11. We're going to look at all these different people who lived by faith and the way that the, the amazing things they did and the, and the amazing things that God did uh, in them. Now, I know I could go right on and begin to read in chapter 11, but I really think I'm going to let the rest of tonight be focused on the idea of faith for just a moment. Um, he says, now, the writer began with a general statement of what faith really is in its nature and action. And then he's just quoting what the verse says. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Right? He says, faith is the spiritual faculty of the soul that deals with the spiritual realities of the future and the unseen. Now, I'm going to try to break this down because I had to read it over and over to grab a hold of what he's saying. Andrew Murray writes at a very uh, deep level for me. Um, he says, it is the faculty that our soul deals with the spiritual realities of the future and of the unseen. Just as we have our senses through which we hold communication with the physical universe. So what he's saying is, I have eyes, I have ears, I can touch and feel. And these senses are what I use to interact with and communicate with uh, this physical universe. Right? Um, but my eyes are of absolute no value if there's no light. Did you know that? Have you ever thought about it? If you've ever, some, depending on the science classes you had, um, your science teacher should have told you <laughs> that your eyes can't see. Light is absolutely necessary. They, they are there. They have the ability, it's all right there, but they're useless without light. So, um, so he, he likens and says the same thing is true about our faith. He says, so faith is the spiritual sense organ through which the soul 
comes into contact with and is affected by the spiritual world. So my eyes come into contact and absorb and receive information from the physical world through my eyes, through my ears, through my sense of touch and smell and all that, right? These are the senses I use to let the natural world come in, to enjoy it, to, to gain information from it, to learn from it, to experience it. All those things I get through my physical senses. I can't tell how pretty a rose smells if I don't have the sense of smell, right? So I would miss out on that beauty. And I can't tell how beautiful a sunrise or a sunset is if my eyes don't work. I can't tell how beautiful the sound of, of a robin is or, or, or a, a cardinal or anything without this sense, right? So I miss out on everything in this world. So many things without the senses. But with the senses, look at what all I enjoy. Sitting by a stream, looking at it, hearing it, smelling. I get these escapes. Beautiful. I, I get kind of caught up in things through my senses, right? Now, what he's doing is he's saying faith is just like that. It's just like your senses, but for the soul. And instead of like your senses help you connect with this natural, physical world and universe. He says faith is like the sense of your soul that helps you to experience and pull in the things from the spirit things from the spiritual world which God everything he created he created to uh, to reveal himself as the creator he says that uh, in, in revelations that we know there's greater because of the creation um, he's revealing himself through creation um, he will go on uh, Andrew Murray will go on and say uh Faith in itself uh, is a sense. In a, faith in itself is a sense with no power beyond the possibility or capability of receiving the impressions of the internal. So here's where I go back to the idea of if the lights aren't on and my eyes aren't getting any information. Okay. Um, if there's no bird singing, my ears aren't getting anything. Right. So even though the ability is there. I get nothing without what God has given me. Light, sound, all these things. That has to be there in order for my ears, my nose, my eyes to make that connection and it's come into me. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. These things all are here, but they do no good until God gives me a bird singing, a beautiful sunrise or sunset. Until God gives those things in the natural realm, all my senses have nothing to enjoy. And they don't even know anything exists. Let's click that now over into the spiritual realm with faith and the soul. If faith is like the sense of the soul, faith sits here dormant until the Almighty comes near. When he comes near, all of a sudden, faith sees, experiences, and taps into him but if he doesn't come near in what he says or what he does then faith can't believe in something it has, it has no innate power all by itself without God showing up yeah, it needs its own light it needs its own yes yeah. so God is the one who allowed and all faith does is connects us to that spiritual world so that we can receive remember we're saved by grace how through faith. Faith is the sense in which it comes through. It's the pipeline. We God has given us the gift of faith. But if God doesn't show up, who do we believe in? It's almost like the eyes or the sun is the light to the eye. And Christ is the light to men. Yep. Right. We're in the darkness, right? The light. The darkness could not comprehend the light. Yep. The idea that he is the light of men. Right. The light came into the world. He is the light of the men. Right. So, yeah, I think what Andrew Mary is tapping into is quite profound. It's really it's an interesting way to look at it, yeah. Faith is the uh, the means in which we interact with the Absolutely. spiritual realm. There's no way to interact with the spiritual realm without it. 
means in which we interact with the physical realm. Yeah, it's, it's the only way. And that's why you'll notice when people are healed by Jesus, right? He'll say their faith healed them. God's standing in front of them, but they still have to have the connection to yeah, God good. by faith. They believed in Jesus, and so the woman reached out and touched the hem of her garment. What caused her arm to reach out and touch, the Bible says, was faith. She believed that if she touched, and when she did, it was not her physical hand touching his garment that did it. It was the faith in her soul that caused her to tap into a spiritual being that caused power to move into her and heal her. And faith is how everything happens. He says in prayer, you should not ask anything. If you ask and do not believe, you won't receive anything. You see, it's not our words. It's not our words. It's not in the asking. It's in the faith in who we ask. It's the faith. That's why, that's why the definition says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We're talking about an unseen world. A God who is unseen and all of his angels are unseen for the most part. Occasionally God lets us see things as humans that are in the spirit realm. But we live in a natural world and we interact with this natural world through the senses he's given us. And the light that he allowed us to have and the sounds he's allowed us to have and all those things. And so just realizing that we should be living life. I've got to kind of end tonight for a moment. But think about this. We should be living life with our faith interacting with the spiritual world that God has surrounded us with. That he so has invited us into when he tore the veil. He's invited us into this relationship with an unseen person. He's invited us into a relationship, not just to get a fire insurance policy, but he's invited us into a relationship with someone you can't see and someone you can't hear with your physical ears unless he allows it in small portions, which he has throughout time. But for the most part, your whole interaction with this God who created the heavens and the earth and everything that we know and don't know, your whole Interaction, your whole relationship will all be done through the sense of the soul called faith. You will believe God. Yes, ma'am. So, for those who a have never ever heard about God, they know nothing about it, completely ignorant to the Bible. You have to you have to connect with God because something is inside of you, and it eventually brings you to your faith. But for those who don't know how. For those who don't know and those who don't believe and do know, like how do you, how do you, how do you explain those people that just don't know how do they get to heaven? How do they build that relationship when they don't even know something of, of higher money or power exists to begin with? I think is in the part B of my question is pretty much whenever you're trying to raise your children up in a way that they haven't made that commitment yet, and you don't want to force that on them, but you want to, with my kid, I, just keep, I keep trying to like get him there, yeah. and guide him there, and he ain't getting there, <laughs> it's frustrating me. Yeah. And it's not my choice, and I don't want to force him into it, and I know he, he's on the right path, but then he doesn't want to do it, right. sort of thing. But I'm also curious, if people who have absolutely no upbringing in the church, or know about the Bible, are they just lost souls? They are, uh, but it's why we're given the Great Commission. Jesus gives that at the end of Matthew. Mm -hmm. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. Tell people about me. And and even if uh, I was going to, there, there's a sermon inside me. I don't know if it's going to be this Sunday, but uh, about this very thing. That Great Commission of going and preaching the gospel. How will they know if? No one tells them is what another verse says. How will they believe if, if no one preaches to them? How? That's what he says. So he gives us this as, and that's why he calls us as his church, uh, a royal priesthood. All right? Because we are, in fact, a kingdom of priests. When you are born again and, and the spirit of the living God comes out of you, and now you are called his temple, he says you're a priest. 
And as a priest, what do we do? Well, a priest is a mediator between mankind and God. We carry his message now. And there's nobody that's not given that commission. So it's not just the pastor, the Sunday school teachers, or, or the deacons, or you know, it's a youth minister, or whatever. It's if you accept his grace to be born again and his spirit comes inside of you, you've accepted the call, as we could say with Kathy, you've just accepted joining his army. You're in, you're a part of it now. And there's an accountability factor. Uh, it'd be like saying, um, I'm going down and I'm joining the Marines. Sign them on the dotted line because I'm going to go to college and the government's going to pay for it. And they go, okay, boot camp starts next week. Oh, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, I just want it for the college money and the uniform. And I want to be able to wear a t-shirt and wear a hat that says I'm a Marine. But I'm not into all that hard work. I don't want to do all that. Oh, wait a minute. You need me to go to, you want me to go serve a tour in a hot desert somewhere? Uh-uh. No, no, I signed up for some money from the government to go to college. I didn't sign up for all that. And I think that's where a lot of people look at Christianity. Is I'm signing up to go to heaven, but I'm not signing up to give my life away. And Jesus says, you miss, you didn't read, it wasn't even fine print. <laughs> you didn't even hear the scripture, right? You've got to count the cost. Don't come and follow me if you can't count the cost. It, it's going to cost you your life. We have to give our life away in order to be made anew in him. We don't get to keep our life and his. You trade your life to get his. And so when you do that, yeah, you give up all your own stuff, your world and all that. But what you gain is the world that's coming. And so to go back, I guess, to the original question is, yes, there are many people lost and dying in the world that, are, that will be eternally separated from God. And that's why we give money to missionaries. And that's why we go out as missionaries. And that's why we share the gospel with people we love in the workplaces and our family. And if they laugh at us and they mock us and they reject us, then we just move on to the next person. And we hope and pray that what we've shared will one day bear fruit in their life. That's what we hope and pray. I think, too, actually, it's important to remember that if there is somebody that lives on an island of one, and there's no Bible, obviously, but it's God. And if he wants to call their soul, he's going to. He doesn't need to, you know. Yeah. He's going to knock them on the head with a coconut and say, yes. God. Something will happen. And, right. So, I that makes sense. Yeah, there's a, impossible to look at yeah, there. So. No. There's a grace factor that we were not aware of. We do know that no one comes to the Father except through Christ. There's no way for sin to be forgiven except by the blood of Jesus. We know that. We're absolutely confident. So even if you're on an island and you never heard of Jesus... Um, and God, somehow because you you worship the God who gave you all that you have, but you don't know the name of Jesus. Uh, now, this is where you get different theological ideas, but I really believe that God will have a grace here. Um, now, I don't understand how that works, and I'm not saying that they're saved in any other way besides Christ, but just like he allowed those who lived before Christ, he went back and preached to the captives, um, and those who were righteous put their faith. There's things that we don't understand, and I try not to get into God's world too much on that because I don't know. And if I start speaking and saying it's this way and it's that way, all I'm doing is, is you know, uh, saying here's my best guess. Well, if I'm wrong, I don't want to. I don't want to spread my wrong thinking. But um, I know. I know that we should not count on that. Just because there's people in the world who haven't heard the gospel, that God's going to save them anyways. That's that's called a universalism, and it's you're saying that everybody's going to be saved anyways, and that is not scripture. The Bible plainly says that there's only one way, and, and that He puts that whole thing on us to preach the gospel for a reason, mm -hmm. and it's not just a game; it's very real. So, I think we do need to have a strong conviction to pray for people who haven't believed yet and, and not be in fear, but just believe that God's going to get through to them and keep praying and, um, and live a life. That's probably the greatest thing we can do is our words have a lot more power when we live a life that, that follows what scripture says. So, all right.